Hello everyone. We are in Cafe Hotel today again. And it's still sunny outside. <laughs> it very much is. Um, spring is here. Okay, today we're going to talk about a pioneering woman composer. This will be the third woman composer we are talking about in our uh, podcast. So far. Yes. Yeah, so Plenty more to come. That's true. We have some background music with us again today. Mm -hmm. So we are going to talk about Laurie Spiegel's work, Obsolete Systems. Yeah. Which is a, a fascinating album covering lots of different, not just periods, but different aspects of her work as well. Yeah, so the album was released in 2001, but the contents, the pieces were created at different, different times, from early 70s to expanding, spanning through early 70s to the 80s. And the piece, the starting point for me was the ending piece, Voices Within. I heard it in a different independent context for the first time outside the album. And it mesmerized me the first second I heard it. Mm. It felt like an uh, ambient version of a dark uh, drone metal piece mm -hmm. created with tape loops instead. And it's very dark, isn't it? These long, gentle pitch changes are a bit like sirens. There's a, almost like a kind of war-like feeling to it as well. Yeah, there are siren-like sounds when it goes high-pitched. Uh, but also the build-up, just like the Rain the Dig piece we uh, discussed. The build-up is so very well layered. Yeah. And uh, there are... Uh, Slow, slowly building, rising harmonies, mm -hmm. and they are somewhere in the dark sonorities. Yeah. In that sense, it, re it reminded me. Um, I mean, it's called Voices Within, isn't it? And it made me wonder whether it was like her own voice, like the voices in her head, kind of thing. Whether there was I'm a so curious a to hear psychological the, yes, quality to it. There's a reference to, to Requiem as well, isn't it? It's yes. Voices Within a Requiem, and Requiem masses. Always, it seems to be that the, the great requiem mass, masses, the best part is always the Dies Irae, yeah, which is this the souls in hell sort of screaming yeah. and wailing in hell. So, there's the fantastic one in uh Ligeti's George Ligeti's Requiem, which was used by Kubrick in 2001, and then yeah. there's the Dies Irae and Verdi's Requiem, which is like one of the most exciting bits of music from that period. Uh, and Mo the DSRO for Mozart's Requiem as well. So it has this sort of um, connection to these wailing souls. <laughs> Actually, that's a great take on it. I'm so curious to find out about the source of inspiration behind this piece. Yeah. There is not much uh, written about mm -hmm. it. Maybe we should ask uh, herself. Absolutely, you should contact her, yes, and ask her. I mean, in general, uh, listening across the whole album, th this piece is something really special. And listening across the whole album, I get the feeling that um, darkness really suits her compositionally. I think that the darker the pieces are, the better they are. Yeah, when you compare it to her other works, like the expanding universe, mm. this is much, much darker. Mm. In the expanding universe, what I hear is more like uh, drones and... Uh, that, and also, you know, of, um, the work of reminds me of uh, more of minimal works uh, with uh, happier keys. Yeah. Uh, but uh, so she is not using an instrument with a key set in any of this music, mm -hmm. but uh, with these machines, she created a phoenix. Mm -hmm. And in uh, obsolete systems, that's the darker, darker end of those feelings. Yeah, yeah. And, that's uh, okay. It's timbral, textural music with uh, atmospheric, hauntingly beautiful sounds. But there is also a pitch content hidden in them mm -hmm. that I think uh, brings those darker end of yeah, feelings. Yeah, yeah. 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 But I mean, even you know, uh, even with there's still that thing is that even if you have all the content 
of a particular style or and the, the angle of a particular idea it's still the the personality and the uh, the depth of feeling of the composer comes through you know that, that there is a there is a genuine sense of of uh, um, exploring yeah. the the darkness in this i mean i was wondering i was wondering listening to it whether I mean, she was born in 1945, so there's not really references to the Second World War. Um, I was just wondering whether there was references to Vietnam. Might be. Well, among the composers we discussed so far, she was, she must be the youngest, right? Yes. And yeah, yeah. it's a different time, so and she's from the United States, so she, there might well be references yeah. of yeah. war in Vietnam. But the main thing is. The use of uh, obsolete, in quotation mark equipment mm -hmm. in yeah, this yeah. pieces, um, obsolete systems, and uh, they are now regarded as such. Mm -hmm. But uh, they document uh, something uh, which uh, can be associated with the development and the rise of, of a particular uh, time. Yeah, yeah, yeah and yeah. analog, analog uh, synthesis yeah. uh, systems. Well, it's interesting that the first, the first four pieces in this collection, uh, she calls them four short visits to different worlds. Yeah. You know, which is all about newness and novelty. And again, that, that felt to me like a reference to, uh, uh, or at least a, uh, an analog to uh, Schoenberg's mm -hmm. second string quartet, which has yeah. this 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 uh, soprano part. Okay. Uh, which sings, I have breathed the air of, of another planet, or I feel the air of another planet. Yeah. And it's a bit like that, it's like real sense of total newness and novelty, you know. That's true, actually. And uh, it was also a time uh, when uh, digital systems were being explored, discovered, mm -hmm. and she did use, in one of the pieces, I think she did use a digital audio synthesizer, mm -hmm. and the piece uh, we talked about in the beginning, the one that hits me first, uh, is the only piece that doesn't use any of the analog digital systems or uh, synths, but it is, it's composed with uh, classic tape techniques. Mm. That's much more ancient than the others yeah, yeah. in that sense. But the opening pieces, uh, the first ones are composed with uh, modular and lock synthesizers, mm. including uh, one of them, a, a garden, uh, mm -hmm. which was composed in 1970. Uh, she was she was using the Buchla mm. 100. Uh, which I think she worked with Don. Late. She worked with Don Buchla. I think there was. A, yeah. I mean, this is the thing: is that for uh, um, American composers of this period that they had these uh, wonderful uh, instrument designers kind of on hand, you know. Yeah. It's, there was, you know, Bob Moog, uh, Don Buchler, and so Sheretton in there, you know, that, that they could um, actually access and, and have, a, uh, have some sort of uh, um, dialogue with the instrument makers, which I think is, it, it always makes, makes for something really special. Yeah. Definitely, and uh, she she shaped 
the music of Bell Laboratories. Bell yes. Labs uh, that, that played an important role in the development of electronic music, and she was one of the most dominant figures in there, right? Mm -hmm. As a woman, I, in the in the nineteen seventies, uh, that's really important. Well, also, I mean, uh, dominant character. Uh, as regards music is one thing but she was also dominant in that she had this whole concept of visual music she was very but she's always been very much a visual artist as well yeah with uh, the algorithmic composition tools she did a lot yeah and and uh, she worked in uh, graphics and all sorts of visual software that was also musical so th there's a there's a very very strong very broad range that she has yeah. Especially, I mean, I think that she uh, um, she was originally a mandolin player as well, or something. There's like, ah, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know. So there's like, it's very multi instrumental and yeah. uh, versatile artist, composer, musician, yeah. performer. Yeah, 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 yeah. And she comes from a background, you know, talking about Bell Labs background of computing systems and Bell Bell Labs. Uh, the work at Bell Labs was mostly intended for military or scientific use. Yeah, yeah. But Max Mitius, whose name was given to the audiovisual uh, uh, software, Max MSP, yeah, yeah. Uh, was one of the people who uh, worked in those labs also. Uh, who, who, and he, he, did, uh, he, he is like the first person to was one of the first people to make uh, compose music with a computer, computer music. So. Well, yeah, absolutely, really vitally important. And there's there's one one uh, piece on in this collection, the uh, the harmonic algorithm piece. Yeah, um, Apple which is, two computer. Yeah, which is really really important. I mean, it sounds for us these days, it sounds like a, a, a chat. GPT version of Bach. <laughs> you know, you Actually, could say yeah. to, you could say to ChatGPT, you know, like compose a piece yeah. that sounds like you know uses the uh, harmonic style of of uh, Johann Sebastian Bach, and it would kind of be something like that, wouldn't it? You know, that's yeah. a very accurate analogy. <laughs> yeah, and, and it's it, it's uh, uh, it has become more important to us now mm -hmm. than perhaps they they were aware of at the time of of the importance of uh, algorithm. And uh, you know, uh, allowing some degree of AI to control aspects of your composition so that you could focus on other parts yeah. is essentially uh, a big, powerful drive in all our lives now. on this in the yeah. mid 70s early yeah. 70s yeah. wow i mean that's again just like the previous example it's ahead of its time in a way yeah. and uh, there was also a system which he used for the album we mentioned the expanding universe mm. uh, it's called group i think it's important to mention this album because in a way uh, that was one of the first works she created and uh, what we are discussing today uh, build upon that it uh, has a much more developed sense, maybe uh, that's more of her identity and the music, uh, whereas ex the expanding universe is more of the exploration of those systems. Yeah. And the other one of them was called GRU, Generated Real-Time Output Operations <laughs> on Voltage-Controlled Equipment. It was designed together with Max Matthews. Mm. So, and then... She created the expanding universe with, with that stuff. Yeah, yeah. Thinking about her range, something that I've personally found very, really refreshing in this collection was um, the piece drums. Mm -hmm. um, because so often, you know, so I mean, it's again we, created the group. Yeah, the yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I mean, if you if you think of, uh, I mean, like. Someone like uh, we discussed in a, on a, in our first podcast with uh, Stockhausen. Stockhausen deliberately avoided any form of repetition and regularity and any sense of a rhythmic 
groove, you know. Yeah. Um, and um, you know, we, we have to be thankful to the, the American minimalists for bringing some of that back into kind of concert hall music. This is a, re a really impressive um, exploration of regular rhythm. You know, um, it's something that's very close to my heart, having worked so much on, with Jackie Liebtight and, and on his, his uh, compositional systems and stuff, is hearing uh, how she, she, in this piece, changes the shift of different groupings into threes and fives and eights and sevens. Um, there's even Euclidean distribution of beats in there, mm -hmm. um, and really very uh, sophisticated use of dynamics and accents mm -hmm. and pitch. It's a really very special piece that I think, uh, yeah. and and shows a sensitivity and skill with rhythm um, that lots of people working in this the area of music that she's dealing with. Yeah, have, it's just totally over their heads. You know, it's really quite impressive. Yeah. So uh, you know, for, for me, that was that was one that really, really leapt out as something, something really special. I think I also feel a combination of, you know, both sides of the brain, mm. like the scientific, logical side and the emotional, creative part. Mm -hmm. uh, it looks like she mastered uh, something in both of them and then combines them, and that's reflected in the music. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's. I mean, it's interesting. You know, a little like Hugh Lacane, who we spoke spoke about in the last episode. Uh, you know, uh, um, that he was someone that was kind of uncomfortable with 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 uh, being confident with his creative side. Yeah. That it was very much like it was very self depreciative, but very, he was focusing totally on his technical side. Mm -hmm. Whereas as she's, she, you know, with all the software that she was involved with writing, with all the, the new musical systems, and especially this algorithmic stuff, she was equally as comfortable with that as she was as, a, uh, as an artist and a composer, you know, yeah. and performer. That's true, and also that way she could explore the parts uh, of sounds that you would not hear uh, in everyday production. When I'm going back to the piece, the voices within. Mm -hmm. he, she, uh, there was a structure in, in a sense, uh, like the patterns you just mentioned. Mm -hmm. For example, Tokasa would avoid. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there is like a structure that changes with time, and then slowly it reveals some pitches, like microtonal sounds. Mm -hmm. in yes. her uh, music yeah. uh, and uh, there's a no that pushes the boundaries or pushes the something that pushes the uh, limits yeah, yeah. well that's, uh, I think uh, uh, I mean in general my feeling was that her, her work is much more successful when she's doing that rather than when she's using the you know uh, to quote Adam Neely the, the harmonic style of 18th century European musicians yeah. <laughs> which is become like the, yeah. the standard term instead of saying musical theory you say the harmonic yeah. style of 18th century yeah. European musicians when she's doing that like there's these pieces on here that are um, the modal pieces and there are also the form the form also yeah, has some yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't want to call it a sonata but there's an ABA or yeah, that yeah. kind of a feel yes yeah music, very, right? very formal very, very structured in a very um quite archaic way. I mean, I was interested to read that um, 
when she was studying for her, either her MA or a doctorate, when she went back to the States after studying here in at, well, in, at Oxford, mm -hmm. um, that she studied a very early American music. Yeah, like, you know, so so that so she had a, a, a foot in kind of very formal and historical music, which she's very very interested in. And I think elements elements of that do spring up, especially in this little group of, of, of pieces on this uh, in this collection, the, the, yeah. the cosmos, a legend, and a myth. You know. Yeah, that's pretty accurate. Yeah, and also she she's using synths there in a way that um, I've come across with 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 uh, uh, musicians and composers before, people who use synthesizers in the way that you would use an orchestra. So you mm -hmm. you choose a sound, mm -hmm. you don't touch the sound. You play melodies, with it. you play parts, and you play parts of it in the way that you would say assign a particular uh, melody or particular part to the viola or the French horns or something. Yeah. You know, imagining it like that rather than uh, the idea of manipulating sound in space. Um, it's a very different approach where you, the, the focus is on the change of the pitch rather than the change of the character of the sound. Yeah, actually, uh, she has some program notes about what the voice is within. Mm. Although I don't see an, a, a whole reference about the main source of inspiration for the absolute system. So we still, we still should ask her. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I would like to share this quick quote from my program notes, and she says, uh, "As well as being a return to a medium I used to use more, mm -hmm. voices within include romantic chord progressions." Which, though mistuned, are practically straight out of Mahler. Interesting. Especially the hand supplies ones near the end. The underlying bass progression, which sustains the momentum of the piece, consists of two contrary moving pairs of lines. Mm. The Lissando motion doubles these stepwise lines to add changing beat patterns. The ABA coda form is really created by texture and timbre, so by the expressive qualities of the sheer material of sound, not by harmony. And then she also concludes, whether we do or do not pursue the components of a complex sound as separate tones, harmony and timbre share an extraordinarily high degree of expressiveness. Wow, wow. Well, you don't... You, yeah. You kind of don't get that when you hear it, do you? It's almost like she's created this this historical and um, technical structure as a as a framework for for yeah. actually expressing something deeper yeah. or yeah. expressing something more personal. Yeah. You know, it's uh, um, because the last the last uh, name that came to my head, you know, after repeated listings to this piece was Marla. <laughs> there you go. There you go. You know. Yeah. 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 So, I think this quote explains what you've been talking about in terms of the parallels yeah. uh, between this and the 18th century music. Yeah, 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 yeah. But see, yeah, but again, she's using it as a as a um, a skeleton, as a structure. Um, yeah. In a in a way to. Uh, to express something very much about herself, I think. Do you think, do you think, Elif, do you think Laurie Spiegel was a bit of a hippie? Why are you asking that question? Well, because of the time, because of the New York scene, and because there seems to be uh, two different, um, seems to be two different creative avenues going here with her. There's this... There is this really wonderful, rich, dark stuff that she does. And then there are these highly patterned diatonic pieces, which are a bit trippy, basically. A bit like a, uh, a hippie blanket. Oh, do you see some connections uh, between this and the research you are doing about Into the drug, drug use? As, yes. As you, as you wrote on the quietus, maybe you include something about this? Well, I mean, there is, there is an enormously strong link between uh, drugs and music, and uh, um, which, which goes back prehistoric times. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we mentioned earlier on that Laurie Spiegel worked with Don Buchler, 
And Don Buckler was famous for um, having one of the modules in his synthesizers so drenched in LSD-25 that when someone brought it out of a brought the piece of equipment out of storage 30 years later and picked it up and used it he started tripping from just the contact on his hands wow you know so those people would do it a lot I see I, uh, yeah uh, then the answer might be yes she might be <laughs> well she's still around better we to can... ask <laughs> yes <laughs> for me it is interesting that, that it does seem to be you know there's hair as a technician hair as this it, this composed of this very dark music relating to 19th century and 18th century European harmonic uh, uh, music um, and then these like happy little trippy mm-hmm. trippy pits I mean some of her music reminds me more of Tangerine Dream actually you have a point like the earlier things like Rubicon or Phaedra or Zeitz right Absolutely. Light, yes. especially. Yeah, 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 yeah. Of taking, you know, having quite simple sequences, playing, using synthesizers for playing simple diatonic things, but in this clean, totally dependable, heavily patterned way. And that that obsessive patterning is very, very closely related to psychedelic drugs, isn't it? Yeah. So yes, yeah, so maybe we should ask Laurie if she still uh, partakes. Maybe. And she doesn't want to talk to us anymore after listening to this. <laughs> <laughs> but, but no, I mean, it's uh, really, I'm um, still mesmerized by the voices within. Uh, it's a, it's uh, going to my list of all-time favorite pieces of music. I love it that way, and it inspires my own music. Now we can see it in... Later documentaries, people are more, talking more about this stuff now, mm. like sisters with trans sisters, okay. But before that, yeah, she has been around doing this for many, many years. Mm, absolutely. Uh, deserving all the recognition she's getting through those talks and documentaries. Uh, and she did deserve that much earlier. Um, I'm happy like we, she, she can't get it uh, while uh, she's here in this world. Yes, yeah, yeah that she's, she's still with us. Going strong. Yeah. Cheers. Cheers.